everyone. This is Jill Hurston with Synersip. Welcome to our webinar today. I'd like to remind everyone that I will be recording this session and you will receive an email directly from me with a link to the presentation recording and to the uh, slides. Also, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to chat into the question box and our moderator will look at all of those and make sure they all get answered. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Watson. He's our VP of Engineering at CenterZip. He's going to be today's moderator. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Jill. And welcome, everyone, to today's webinar, The Intrapreneur's Journey, Empowering Employees to Drive Growth. Today's webinar presents a model for creating a culture of innovation within your organization. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. We have Hugh Malazzi, he's CEO of Pujama, and also Jeff Zayas, Innovation Leader at Intuit. I want to remind everyone that uh, we will fill field questions throughout the webinar, so feel free to enter questions as, you, as they come up, and we'll do our best to answer them. With that, Jeff, over to you. Great. Thanks, Mike. So we're here to talk to you about how to empower your employees to drive growth. I've spent the last 14 years working at Intuit, um, time flies, and helping employees to be more effective innovators. I like to focus on how employees with the right organizational support can create breakthrough innovations within the company. Well, hello everybody, my name is uh, Hugh Malazzi. Um, I am a CEO of Ujama, which is a mobile platform where parents help parents. I spent uh, the bulk of my career, 22 years at Intuit, where I served uh, various roles, mostly in the small business group, uh, but eventually I was an innovation leader working across the company. Uh, today we want to share with you what we learned about freeing employees and their companies to be highly innovative, delivering more value to customers. We want to tell you a few stories about what has worked at companies like Atlassian, Intuit, Google, 3M, and other innovative companies. Now to start, we believe that the biggest underutilized assets in most companies are the ideas in their employees' heads. Now this is because of what we call the insight decision divide. In a typical company, frontline employees spend most of their days serving customers or working on products. They are constantly bombarded with insights on how to better serve customers and address unsolved opportunities. But they don't have the decision-making authority to make those kinds of decisions. Instead, those decisions are made by senior leaders who spend most of their days in meetings with other senior leaders. And hence, you have a divide between where insights are happening and where decisions are being made. Now, this divide results in missed opportunities where companies miss out on game-changing innovations. Most of you have heard about how when Steve Wozniak was an HP employee, he begged the company five times to make the computer that essentially was the Apple One. But he was unable to, and of course, you know the future of it. Uh, he ended up teaming up with a guy called Steve Jobs and that became Apple. But it doesn't have to always turn out that way. There are companies that have taken advantage of frontline employees' ideas by empowering them to work on those ideas. Gmail is a good example of this. Gmail was the brainchild of Paul Buckeit. He had been uh, working on a project called Google Groups, and um, uh, when that project closed, uh, shut down, he realized, oh, he can build an email uh, solution from, from that code. And um, the rest is history, of course. Uh, Gmail today is the, the most used email solution in the world. So we believe all companies can benefit by building a culture of innovation where their employees are empowered to work on their own ideas. To build such a culture, we've developed this entrepreneurship empowerment model so you can build a sustainable and an effective innovation program. The model consists of giving employees time and freedom, deploying design thinking, encouraging open collaboration, fostering an experimentation culture, staffing a dedicated innovation team to foster that culture, and aligning the organization to say yes to entrepreneurs. And we're going to walk you through each of these in a little more detail. So as you just saw, one of the six facets of our model we call time and freedom. 
And the idea is this, when employees have a sense of freedom, they're more creative, they feel more engaged in the work they're doing, and they're able to take a bolder approach when trying out solutions. So employees are given self-directed time, carved out from their day jobs to work on their own projects. For employees to be able to work on these ideas, they need to have time set, a set aside to work on them. No matter how great an idea is, if the employee's time is fully consumed by the side work, they're not going to be able to move that idea forward. Freedom, we define as giving employees the autonomy to choose which ideas and projects to work on. So it's really the air cover they have so that a manager doesn't stifle their output. So we feel an effective step to take is to support programs that explicitly give employees the time and freedom to be creative, to tap into their passion, and to solve big problems. One example of this is Intuit's Unstructured Time program, a program that encourages employees to take roughly 10% of their overall time and do things that are aligned with their own purpose and passion that might drive growth for the company. So an example of an Unstructured Time project that was very successful is the project at Intuit that became a big strategic growth driver for the whole company. Here's what happened. So two employees, Amir and Carol, had this idea that mobile devices were becoming more and more acceptable to users. This was eight years ago. So they're seeing this pattern, and they're seeing that users wanted to use mobile devices to do more and more sorts of work. So they figured it was possible that people even wanted to prepare and maybe file tax forms with a mobile device. So it was a while back, so, you know, other employees really did think the idea was crazy, but Amir and Carol took their instructor time and started building prototypes of a mobile tax app, and they ran tests with customers. Their work created some breakthroughs. They did, a, you know, they achieved a lot of learning with the prototypes and the experiments, and they understood much better what customers really wanted. So the prototypes and experiments that they ran in unstructured time led to finding a way to build an app that made tax filing easy on the phone. The outcome, since Amir and Carol had this data showing what was working for customers, led to the outcome of funding for a concerted mobile tax product effort that now in retrospect has enabled Intuit to grow the entire tax business at a much faster rate while meeting this new desire customers to use mobile devices to do pretty much all their work. So Instructure Time allowed them to work on this crazy idea and make it a reality. In fact, Amir has a quote, you know, he often says, you can't argue with working code, it becomes your talking piece. Another example we want to talk about is Atlassian Ship It Days. And these Ship It Days allow every employee in the company to self-form a team and compete with other employees to ship a new innovation within 24 hours. Atlassian really wants employees to do something other than their regular job here. They want people to be employees, to be bold, adventurous, and solve a big problem with creativity. The results have been outstanding for Atlassian. One example of success story is Jira Service Desk, which came out of a Ship It Days competition. So the people pictured here, Andreas, Nick, Mike, Ross, and Scott, spent their 24 hours hacking together a simple portal to create Jira issues. Jira Service Desk is now one of the three major product lines and revenue drivers for the whole company. And it still stands as the fastest growing product line Atlassian ever built. So we can talk now about another facet of our model, design thinking. We feel design thinking is a critically important lever to help employees deeply understand what customers really care about and how to meet the customer needs. Employees use design thinking principles to be effective innovators. And these principles are a relentless focus on customers where entrepreneurs seek to have deep customer empathy and exhaustive consideration of possible solutions before selecting one and refining that solution through rapid iterations of prototypes and developments with customers. So as you see pictured here, Intuit developed its own flavor of design thinking, and we call it design for delight. And we've established three principles which pretty much embody what I just described, which, which are, you know, first, deep customer empathy, the notion of go broad to go narrow, and rapid experimentation with customers. And the way we 
talk about this with employees and literally train employees with on this topic is with deep customer empathy, our goal is to understand our customers better than they understand themselves. So we achieve this empathy by spending lots of time observing customers and their habitat as they go about doing their work and even their home lives. With Go Broad to Go Narrow, the idea is this. To get one great idea, you have to have many ideas. And often the best idea will be a synthesis coming from the many ideas. And the third principle, rapid experimentation with customers, is talking about the idea that you don't start with a perfect plan, you build something quickly and get it in front of customers and learn. And from what we learn, we iterate and improve, eventually getting to a product that delights customers. So we have an example of this. Uh, as you know, many organizations have found success with design thinking. One example from the healthcare space is Kaiser. Kaiser Permanente used design thinking to reimagine how productivity and quality of care can improve. And the major data around problems they found by observing nurse, nursing shift changes was that there were some real issues with the shift changes. Uh, first of all, the nursing shift changes took 40 minutes to achieve. And then a multitude of errors occurred across too many transfers of information. So Kaiser employees using design thinking studied through observation what was going on with nurses and the patients and their interactions. They observed a number of behaviors that rep represented these key opportunities to improve. So with the shift changes, they found the slowness um, had some root causes and they ran prototypes and experiments to find what could lead to a better outcome. And indeed, they found some breakthroughs. So the results were amazing for Kaiser. They introduced a new shift change process and cut the time from 40 minutes to 12 minutes for a nursing shift change. And more critically, they reduced errors during, during this shift change information transfer. So this obviously improved health healthcare and also increased patient confidence. Okay, so the next uh, facet of our model we're going to talk about is experimentation. In an experimentation culture, employees are provided the tools and infrastructure to test their ideas. Decisions are made with data instead of opinions. Instead of arguing over ideas, employees run experiments to measure which idea has the most merit. When you make decisions by experimentation, the best ideas win. Now, this experimentation mindset is exemplified in Eric Reese's The Lean Startup, a book we highly recommend. And let me tell you a little bit about Eric's sto personal story. After he graduated from college, um, he didn't go into the regular corporate world. He actually went straight into working for startups. And so he got the experience of working for startups that were unsuccessful, that failed, and startups that succeeded. And he had this really uh, key insight. He found that there was this common misconception that successful startups were successful because they had good ideas, and the unsuccessful startups, they, you know, they failed because they were working on a bad idea. Instead, he said, all ideas suck. Successful startups are the ones with the best process. Now, that's a weird thing to say. You wouldn't normally think process and startup belong in the same sentence. But what he meant is that every idea is fundamentally flawed in ways you won't discover until customers use your product. In the Lean Startup Build Measure Learn loop, you take an idea, build it, deploy it to customers, and through measurement, learn what's working and what's not working, and use that learning to make your idea better. Startups with the best process go through the Build Measure loop very quickly, so they're able to iterate several times to eventually perfect their idea. Startups with a poor process spend all their time and funding building one idea and fail when that product doesn't work for customers. Now, Google has been a leader in using experiments to constantly improve their search engine algorithms. One of these search improvements was called Google Panda, and it's named after Navneet Panda, one of the engineers who helped develop the algorithm. Now, Google's original PageRank algorithm ranked pages by how many other pages linked to that page. Before Panda, 
people had been gaming the system by building link farms to get their low quality websites, which typically had lots of ads, to show up high on search results. Panda worked by evaluating whole websites instead of just a single page. And on its first release in 2011, search improved dramatically for everybody as spammy websites no longer featured prominently on search results. And through experimentation, Google has continued to improve the Panda algorithm. Open collaboration encourages employees to effectively collaborate with each other, with customers, vendors, and partners over organizational boundaries and geographic boundaries. So the thought is you never really know who will provide that one missing ingredient that's going to help turn an idea into a great innovation. At 3M, scientists have this methodology of presenting seminars to each other across the whole company, sharing their latest inventions in the hope that a product developer or another scientist will see a way to apply the invention to solve a customer need. So many people know the story of the, the post-it note and uh, appreciate the product, but there's, there's some interesting details in terms of how it came about. So Spencer Silver was a scientist who accidentally developed this low-tack, reusable, pressure-sensitive adhesive. It was very strange as an adhesive. He didn't know how it could be used to apply to solve a customer problem. He didn't know it was unique. So Art Fry, another 3M scientist, attended one of Spencer's seminars and got the idea for a sticky bookmark. And without this collaboration really set up across the whole company, Post-it notes wouldn't have come about. And now Post-it notes are a major revenue driver for 3M of course, and an iconic part of offices across the world. Now, to sustain that culture of innovation, employees must be supported by a dedicated innovation team who will provide the tools, mindset, and guidance needed to accelerate the innovative progress. These dedicated capability builders will become powerful tuners and amplifiers for your thriving culture of entrepreneurship. Peter Drucker said, only three things happen naturally in organizations, friction, confusion, and underperformance. Everything else requires leadership. Indeed, even innovation in your company won't happen naturally. A dedicated innovation team is critical. Now let's use Google as an example of innovation leadership. Google has a facility they call the garage. The garage is a lab set up for employees to use their 20% time to express their creativity. The garage is absolutely packed with equipment from 3D printers to shop vacs to sewing machines to a CNC milling machine. Employees can take classes on how to use this equipment but for the garage to operate requires full-time employees to manage and maintain it. Now, speaking of Google, there's a myth you may have heard that Google no longer supports 20% time. Or some people malign 20% time by calling it 120% time. In fact, Google's 20% time is still in place, although according to Laszlo Block, uh, their former HR leader, only about 10% of employees are using it. The perception that the program has been canceled came after the Google Labs team was disbanded in 2011. At the time, Google's leaders thought that Labs type innovation work should align within divisions. For example, Gmail Labs. So the central team was no longer needed to nurture 20% time and support the experimentation processes. But what they failed to consider was that without the Google Labs team, support for internal into innovators would dwindle. And the damaging perception of, I guess, 20% time isn't going to really happen anymore would heighten. Without the Google Labs team, true entropy of the culture of experimentation, freedom, and time of entrepreneurship um, could kick in. Now, in spite of these challenges, Google continues to be a shining example of the effectiveness of entrepreneurial time. 
as indicated earlier, you know, half of uh, Google's products and 25% of their revenue came from projects birthed in 20% time. And those wins include even more recent products like Google Now and the Android Watch. Hey, Hugh, did the um, HR person at Google that you mentioned, did they suggest why only 10%, there's only a 10% take up on the 20%? You know, I don't remember the, the – Jeff, you may remember the details behind uh, – if he, he said more uh, beyond that 10% of people are using it. You know, it, it's, it's not – it was never clear um, they had a strict measurement, actually, across the whole company. So it, also part of his point, um, I believe, you know, reading his articles, the articles from Laszlo Block with, Bach was that – you know, even 10% would be fine. Um, so, so uh, you know, a, I'm not sure if, if they measured that company-wide. Yeah, and, and a lot of our insights, uh, Mike, came from, uh, you know, a lot of the discussions we had with uh, people who were involved with the Google Labs teams um, during, uh, while they were around and afterwards. And, you know, there was quite a considered effort to make sure that managers were encouraging uh, their employees to use their 20 percent time um, you know celebrating those managers who um, whose employees had 20 percent time projects you know and nudging the managers who were not and so that way really encouraging the right behavior but once you got rid of the Google Labs team a lot of that uh, support uh, went away and uh, and so hence hence you you got uh, a lot of uh, the, uh, uh, you know, I guess the the, the expected uh, reduction in, in usage of the program. Okay, thanks. Um, one other follow-up question on that is, um, do they still feel like they're as innovative as they were before the change? Is there any insight on that? You know, I don't have any insight on that in particular. Um, it's it's. Uh, you know, I would, I would certainly say for a company that really celebrated 20% time, I mean, it's telling that uh, so many people, so few people are actually using the program. I mean, again, it's not gone. It's still producing results. But it's certainly true that it's uh, not as widely uh, used as it once was. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk about a line for yes now. So what does that mean? When an organization is aligned for yes, entrepreneurs are provided the funding, resources, and organizational support they need to succeed. Functional groups become partners in innovation instead of roadblocks to overcome. So indulge us in this silly example. Here's a boss talking to his employee. Hey, where are you going with that ax? You told me that data security was my number one priority. So, so now I'm going to cut the cable to the data center. So clearly this is a silly example because cutting a cable to a data center would not be a reasonable solution for providing data security. Because while it's true data must be secured, it must also be available to run the business. And in the same way that everybody should be thinking about running the business, it's everybody's job to think about innovation. Nobody should see themselves as a spectator to innovation or a stumbling block to innovation. In fact, Intuit's chairman has said, our job is not to put barriers up and tell you why you can't. The job of all functions is to find a way to get to yes and to do it with speed as the currency. So to bridge the inside division, the inside division divide, decision divide, sorry, you should empower your employees to work on their own ideas. Our entrepreneurship empowerment model will help you deploy a culture of innovation that is both effective and sustainable. Now Jeff and I have written the book, The Entrepreneur's Journey, and we've written it as a practical guide for deploying the model, and it also includes lots of lessons we've learned from leading innovative companies. Thank you so much for your attention today.
Thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, at this point, we'd like to have everyone start entering questions based on what you've heard today. Um, the more the better. Uh, while the questions are coming in, I'm going to go ahead and uh, quickly give you an overview of Synerzip. Hugh, uh, if you don't mind moving the slides forward. Can we move it one more, please? So Synerzip, uh, as it says here, is an agile software code development partner. What that really means is uh, we help our customers go faster in a cost-effective way. Um, we also have the ability to um, help them with scaling and with uh, bringing in talent that they may not have access to or uh, need access to for long periods of time. Next slide. So Synergy has been in business for over 14 years, uh, had 150 plus customers. Um, this is a representative list of those customers. Uh, we're very happy with our customers and they're very happy with us. Um, most, if not all of them are referenceable and you can find these references on our website, including testimonials. Next slide. So our next webinar in the series is coming up Tuesday, April 16th, and uh, I'm the presenter, actually. I'm not going to be in the moderator role this time. Uh, the topic is Agile Enough, going agile when everyone else isn't. And the idea behind this topic is um, many of us in engineering are used to being agile, but uh, we find a lot of resistance as we, as we move outside of the engineering organization. Uh, so uh, using one of the concepts from this um, this webinar, uh, enabling yes, is something that is a big part of that. So um, something that I really enjoyed listening to on this one. And with that, let's uh, jump into questions. So I have a question from the audience. How do you suggest evaluating employees that are utilizing 20% time? How do you measure the effectiveness of this time? Yeah, I can jump in on that one. Um, I, I think there's two questions there. There's kind of measuring the effectiveness of 20% time and evaluating the employees. Um, so actually, I could probably use a little clarification on that. But uh, I'll, I'll describe my assumption <laughs> about the question. So, so um, one thing that was very important to us at Intuit, and we, we know that other companies have done this, is basically having metrics in place that make it clear not only is there active use and of, of a program and how are people feeling about the program, but is it generating the business results that matter? So we had, uh, in terms of 20% time or in structured time, metrics in place like um, are people using it? Are people uh, testing ideas, coming up with new ideas? Are they going to hackathons? Are they um, entering projects into an overall idea management system where they're basically pursuing things that are going to do something uh, very good for customers. And then through qualitative measures like success stories, um, you know, storytelling, plus also totaling up, uh, hey, you know, in terms of new features, new product lines, which percentage and which ones came from the grassroots, came from on structure time and had an origin in a, you know, entirely employee-driven, um, you know, in terms of getting the overall outcome, we would keep track of that too. So that that's goes to the, how do we look at, is the program happening? Is it effective? Is it actually aligning to driving better business results, which is very important, you know, as well. That's basically we're saying this drives growth. This is not just only for fun and engagement, although we measure fun and engagement as well. Yeah, so uh, the next question on the line is, what's your take on having an internal shark tank-like mechanism to evaluate ideas uh, and where in entrepreneurship is focused? Yeah, let me jump in there. Um, so it, it might surprise a lot of people that I'm not, you know, I, I find the Shark Tank show uh, be very entertaining and actually 
in many ways also very educational. But um, I tend to cringe when I hear companies uh, putting together Shark Tank panels. Um, and and why, do, why is this the case? Um, because if you look at what we try to push in, a, in a, what we believe is a good culture of innovation is where you have experimentation. Where instead of somebody um, who has been deigned to be uh, smart or have some kind of wisdom, instead of them deciding whether an idea is worthy or not, um, you, you actually say to people, go out there, um, run your experiments with real customers, come back with data, uh, and your data will, will, should make itself evident whether this is something uh, of value to the company or not. Uh, and then that's, that's a much better way of, uh, um, you know, of, of deciding uh, whether a project should move forward, should get more funding or, or, or not. Um, so, so we, 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 you know, we, we, we're not in favor of uh, panels where ideas are judged. Now, you could have a, a panel where um, you have uh, people who are maybe uh, evaluating how well uh, a team ran the experiments, how well uh, they collected data, uh, how, how compelling their metri metrics are. Maybe that is something that a, a Shark Tank-like panel could be good for. But when you're just judging ideas, you know, I, I tell people there are lots and lots of ideas um, that uh, uh, have come across my way that I thought were uh, absolute winners and, uh, you know, didn't actually succeed. And then the opposite, you know, ideas that I thought were absolutely awful um, but ended up being, um, uh, you know, very successful. Uh, and just to share a funny anecdote, um, Evan Spiegel, the, uh, uh, the founder of Snapchat, he actually was an intern at uh, Intuit. And um, uh, this was before he, he founded his company. But I remember the first time I, I heard the idea he had for Snapchat, I, I thought it was one of the worst ideas I'd ever heard, uh, in part because, you know, the whole idea that there's a message that somebody would send and it would disappear after a length of time, and also the idea of why would somebody want to send you a, a message that disappears uh, just made it seem like a very unseemly and poor idea. But you can't argue with the success that they had um, uh, in building that company. And that's why it's so important to actually run, take your ideas and actually turn them into experiments. Uh, and the data will, will again, prove uh, what's, what's worthy and what's not. I'll just uh, add one specific example, uh, building on what Hugh said, just because this is uh, a very popular topic. And, and I, I think where it comes from is, is a good place, which is, hey, there's a hit TV show that has some, something of an innovation theme. And so there's energy there. Why don't I leverage that? So, you know, like Hugh was saying, it's possible to um, maybe morph the shark tank into something that's actually good or, or not destructive. So one particular example um, I'll pull from our past and into it. We did an innovation program with a university called Marshall University in West Virginia. And we had the opportunity, it, it started just like this question, like, hey, you know, at the end of this innovation seminar and this innovation program you're running for students and faculty, can we have a shark tank? And then my response was much like what you just heard from Hugh in terms of that we don't want to be judging ideas and this, this you know, everything about what we're trying to do is, is trying to set the right message and direction and tools in place for great innovation. So it, the question became, but, but wait, you know, we have, we have literally Jennifer Garner, the movie star, and Brad Smith, and Chad Pennington, the most successful uh, football quarterback who ever went to that school, you know, available to be judges. So what we did is we kind of made a Shark Tank intervention. We morphed the situation to, well, what are these three people? They're, they're smart and helpful and famous. What if we make them coaches? And they basically use an innovation process scorecard. So they're not judging the ideas. They're, at, they're on stage asking questions like, oh, you know, how did you get empathy from customers? Or well, what did you learn here? What experiments did you run? And that became the coaching type feedback. So again, not judging the ideas, but more like, hey, we have helpful, knowledgeable people that are asking good questions about innovation process. So for me, that's one thing. Uh, instead of putting up the hand and saying a flat no to a shark tank, there's a way to morph it into something healthy.
Uh, that's very insightful. Um, my next question is um, related to uh, applying this in various industries, um, and specifically, does this model apply well in a service industry? Uh, somewhere like Synerzip, where we're providing a service to our, our customers versus, you know, uh, working on our own products. Right. Um, I'll, I'll jump in uh, first, or uh, if we both have uh, thoughts on this, but for me, it's the, the issue is simply, do you have any customers? It, you know, so if you have customers, I think this all applies, because much of what we're talking about is having the culture in place to enable great innovation at speed for customers. And then, you know, even in technology, more and more what's happened is you're delivering, delivering an experience or a service, not so much a shrink-wrapped thing. So, so I, I would say we've probably seen this applied more towards a service or innovating experiences than almost anything else. So it definitely applies. Um, it's probably difficult to give a help, helpful answer without getting knowing more of the details of what's going on there. But I think all every one of these six facets of the model apply to the environment and the tools and the customer focus for innovation that that work as long as you have a customer in mind. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. You know, in the book, uh, we also talk about. Uh, you know, your customer could be an internal customer. Uh, we give an example of an HR team that was trying to improve the new hire orientation process and how they used, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, d d the design thinking techniques um, to essentially study uh, people's experience going through uh, the, the process to, to identify opportunities for improvement, to run experiments on those improvements, uh, and just do multiple iterations until they, you know, eventually made some significant breakthroughs. Um, you know, Jeff, in uh, our presentation today, he shared the example of Kaiser Permanente, um, how uh, in that environment, which is, you know, hospital environment, uh, you know, the, the changing of shifts for nurses, uh, you know, that's, 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 that's very far from a technology um, application that people may normally think uh, with uh, the, these, uh, these types of, uh, techniques apply. So, so, you know, just given our experience, uh, having learned from other companies and having learned lots of stories, I would say that, uh, yes, what, what, what Jeff is saying is correct, is that um, th this, this applies if you have a customer and you can learn from that customer um, and you can have an organization that's more customer focused, um, you will benefit from, from, from all of these uh, techniques. Okay, perfect. Um, so one of the things you mentioned is uh, culture and establishing a culture. And I'm guessing, and so my question is, does your book explain your process for introducing this into a culture? And uh, do you have any you know, high level thoughts about the best way to go forward when you want to try to apply this? Yeah, you know, we, in the book, we, we tell a story of uh, a lady called Patty Porter who, um, you know, goes through this journey of uh, leading this uh, culture change at her company. And uh, there are a, couple, a few setbacks that she has to overcome as uh, she's going through this journey. So hopefully what people will see is that, um, you know, expect that there will be some uh, difficult issues that one has to resolve. Expect that you may have to have um, some setbacks to overcome, but hopefully by sharing uh, what uh, the stories that we're sharing in the book, um, you don't have to uh, uh, relearn the lessons that other people have already uh, have already learned. Uh, but I would say, you know, off the top, one of the the, the biggest things we tell people is, uh, if you're introducing a, a change like this, especially to a company that's big and maybe uh, there's a lot of skepticism, um, you know, it's it's good to start then with a small group. Start with a a, a, a small segment of the company where maybe the support is 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 strongest, and um, and then use that as your test bed, and and hopefully with the progress you make there, uh, you're able to then uh, start to convince the other parts of the organization to join you. Uh, this is basically what happened at Intuit with unstructured time. 
it was first introduced to in the small business groups uh, uh, product development uh, group and eventually it uh, it then uh, expanded to other parts of the company so so we we believe that uh, uh, starting small um, is is one of the paths one of the best practices in terms of uh, introducing this kind of a culture change and a related question is um, so I understand the starting small and expanding that totally makes sense to me um, but what about applying all the six elements at once versus introducing them, you know, one at a time or in a reasonable order? Uh, what do you find works best there? Yeah, one of the things we, we provided in the book was uh, for people to assess where they are as a company. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a short assessment. You answer questions based on your perception of where your company is. And then based on that, uh, we basically indicate here's where we think uh, you'll get the most value by starting off. So, so no, you don't necessarily have to work on all six at once. Um, you can start with uh, the places where you think you'll get the most bang for the buck. Um, but however, we, I think our point of view is, you know, ultimately, if you're going to have a program that is uh, sustainable and effective, you want to eventually be able to say that you you are strong in all six areas. Okay, thank you for that. Um, one other question. Um, this is the last one I have actually. Is how do you uh, how do you move from the experimenting phase to an actual project? Do you have a, a preference of how that happens or a recommendation? You know, there there are uh, a few thoughts in there. Um, one would be, uh, and hopefully this doesn't sound too theoretical, but there, there's one way of, of viewing all your product lines and everything you do as a series of experiments. So there, there's, there's one way of viewing um, the answer, which is you're always learning, whether it's a brand new innovation or a mature product line or whatever the case is. In the context of you know, our model and a, a completely brand new um, grassroots innovation, uh, some of the examples we talked through were, were getting to the point of, look, you know, you can sm start very, very small um, with, with an idea, with a self-formed team. In the most extreme example, you might have two or three people, like the, like the uh, mobile tax example we gave. And then, then your goal is not to immediately build and scale this thing and ship it through the, the major product center because that's not realistic. The goal would be to get the customer learning and the customer data that enables uh, good decisions to be made. So addressing your question in that regard, I'd say the experimentation, um, if, if again, the example of a start from scratch type approach may go from everything from very, very low fidelity prototypes to get a qualitative read on what's actually going to work for customers. And generally that's accompanied by a lot of iteration. Um, as we've talked about, uh, and as design thinking and lean startup truly believes, very, very few ideas, if ever, were right out of the gate. They're pretty much all wrong and all success comes from, you know, course corrections and iteration based on learning from customers. So we'd say you go from low fidelity prototypes all the way to smart, efficient experiments that bring in some data like hey people actually want this thing here's the here's the proof not at extremely large numbers but at growing size cohorts that even a very small team with minimal tool sets can can come back and garner that data so the, the combination of that qualitative learning as well as experiments that are pretty efficient uh, that bring in some quantitative learning can generally get a great decision at that point in terms of more support for this thing that has proof it actually works for customers. Okay, great. Um, one more question came in and uh, it's a slightly different focus, but basically what do you think are the essential traits of an entrepreneur? What makes someone a good entrepreneur? Um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll take a first pass at it. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, 
perhaps one of the most important traits is uh, people who are willing to question the status quo. Uh, you know, whenever you join a company, um, especially a company that has had success, uh, that has ha that has successful products, it's very easy to just accept uh, the way things are. And uh, a lot of times, uh, doing something that's truly innovative means uh, disrupting a, a current process or a current way a product is built. Um, and um, you know, again, it takes a, the person who is willing to stick their head out and say, you know, I think we should try and do something different. And um, they, these these people, these entrepreneurs, are not too easily discouraged by uh, naysayers. People who say, oh, that would never work, or that doesn't make sense. You know, they 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 have a belief uh, uh, in their idea. They have passion in the idea to really follow it through. So I think this this this. Uh, notion of uh, questioning the status quo is important but I also think uh, really great entrepreneurs you know are about action not just about talking you know they, they don't they don't just say okay I have all these ideas they actually try and make them happen um, so those are those are the ones that jump to mind for me I don't know Jeff you have others yeah I mean those are certainly primary keys I, I think uh, uh, another um, is that it's similar to an entrepreneur, like, like somebody who who is not afraid to just stare at the truth, because uh, because a lot of times, or I'll, I'll give the counter example, somebody who's a poor entrepreneur um, probably leads with opinion and doesn't run experiments, and is always in sell mode, and what they do may not turn out to align to actual customer needs, or very often won't. So in my experience, the people who are just very much rooted in the real world and willing to be wrong and willing to pivot and learn and run experiments um, are, you know, have the aptitude of becoming great entrepreneurs. I think related to that is this notion of perseverance that, that Hugh mentioned. And it, there's something in there about being immune to learned helplessness. Because a lot of times we have these situations where the bureaucracy has smacked people down enough where they just give up and they just feel something's impossible. And the best entrepreneurs I've seen, they're wanting to get close to customers, they're wanting to experiment and live in the real world, but they, they also have gotten over the learned helplessness and they just don't believe people can stop them. Okay, uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions, so we're at the end of the webinar time. I want to thank both you, Hugh and Jeff for joining us today and uh, speaking on this topic it was very interesting. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to follow up with uh, me or reach out to Hugh or Jeff. I'm sure they'd be glad to answer your questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks for joining.